<laughs> hey, this is Mark Cuban, and you're watching the whole podcast. And for that reason, I'm out. Welcome to the whole. I am Rob Sprantz. I'm Franco Del Valley. I'm Lori Levine. We are joined by Jeremy Piven. I'm very excited for this one, Jeremy. We've been uh, waiting for you for now a good hour talking about going over the movies you're in, uh, just going back. And I was realizing like how long I've known who you were, even from the earliest like 80s movies, you know, is when I first like it's funny when you have a when you see someone's career go. At first, it's just, oh, that guy, that guy is funny. And then, and then as time goes on, then you start to know who you are. And I was just thinking that it bothers me a little bit that you are five years older than me, and yet you look better than I do. Uh, and that's, I don't think it's fair. By, <laughs> by a lot, I'd say. <laughs> right. well, so thank, you. thank you very much for uh, addressing my age. <laughs> um, and for those of you scoring at home, that's what's known as a humble brag. Uh, he celebrates himself for being younger, and then gives me some sort of a false compliment. So, uh, I celebrate you. I'm honored, um, and let's proceed. All right. Well, well. Uh, so, Jeremy, you have a new movie coming out called My Dad's Christmas Date, and yes. uh, here's here's the poster right now. And there we get, go. I won't humble brag on how good you look in the poster, but there it is. And this opens on November sixth, um, and it's in theaters and on demand, um, which is very very cool. People can watch it no matter what, COVID or not. But I think a lot of people are starting to miss the theater, especially around Christmas time. That's kind of what people want to do. Yeah, we we 2020 is the the year of uncertainty. We don't know what's next in any way, shape, or form. And but we we need to laugh. And this movie, when I first read it, I thought, you know, romantic comedies for whatever reason have kind of gone out of fashion. And that's not your fault. That's not the audience's fault. It's the people who make it. It's like we need to make them good, funny, accessible, and edgy. And that's what this was. This isn't your, it's almost like a romantic comedy without the romance and the way that I play this guy, David, who lost his wife and he can't, he hasn't really, he hasn't grieved properly. And so he's trying to, you know, do the right thing by his daughter and they're misconnecting and Olivia crushes it. Um, she's going to be a superstar. I, I, as you mentioned earlier, I've been around forever since the eighties um, um, so I, I've seen, you know, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of great people and she's one of these, I, I mean, I, I'm not just saying it. She, she will, she will be one of these people that we all know and love. Uh, she, you know, she's in high school. She plays uh, my daughter who is grieving as well, but she sees that I'm lonely and in pain. So she takes it upon herself to go into these websites and go into dating sites and then start connecting me with dates unbeknownst to me. Mm -hmm. uh, my character is, is not very cultured. She takes me to the museum. I don't know why I'm there. And suddenly this six foot nine woman approaches me and I don't even know that I'm on a date. Yeah. And she's a foot taller than me and hilarity ensues. <laughs> well, I, you know, we, I saw the trailer and we're going to put the trailer at the end of the episode too for everybody to watch. But, you know, that's the first thing I thought is that, you know, it it is – it is a very funny angle that instead of just you going on dates and being set up, you're basically being sabotaged on these dates. You don't know that they're showing up. You're just going to places and they just happen to be dates that you're completely unaware of. Which is such a great, fun, fertile premise. Um, and Joel Richardson, who's a brilliant and comes from acting royalty, is plays my best friend and she's always busting my balls. And, you know, it's funny because as I've been doing press for it, people are like, they want to know how I played this role and how I could do something so different. And and the irony is that this role is closer to me than probably anything I've ever played. I started with the fact that he's a human being, which is always <laughs> it's great. A good to start. <laughs> um, you know, people, my mom told me, uh, who's, she's been my acting teacher since I was a kid, and she said before I played Ari Gold, she's like, you better be careful. You're going to be in people's living rooms possibly for a while. Mm -hmm. And this is a very specific 
aggressive type A character and be careful that you may be confused for this character. And I, I thought she was crazy. Yeah. Uh, lo and behold, smash cut to present day where, you know, I have people coming up to me on the street going, bro, I'm a douchebag because of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, but you, you played it. So just to give you an idea of how well you played this, right? So um, Ari Gold, I know, is based on Ari um, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, right? Okay, so I, who I've never had one interaction with, but for this show, we're always reaching out to managers, agents, and publicists to see if you know who would like to come on and be a guest and promote things. And whenever I think of a guest, and I'm like, oh, I look it up. If it's Ari Emanuel, I just don't, I don't even bother because I have your Ari in in my head, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not I'm not even gonna go there. I don't think it's gonna work. Listen, he is uh, an incredibly successful. Uh, agent who is branching out and into the sports world, you know, was part of the team that that bought the UFC. I don't know why I'm promoting him now. <laughs> I'm here to promote, promote Ari Emanuel. Oh, we'll be back. We'll be back to the movie. Don't worry. We got time. <laughs> um, but, you know, he he really does his job. And, and, you know, I didn't really say this while I was doing it, but I can say it now that, you know, he's such a unique, specific individual that – um, we use so many of his traits and that's one of the reasons why I think people gravitated towards the show. It was, it felt very real. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were times when we had to back off of certain storylines. They were like, uh, guys, this isn't a documentary. About <laughs> Emanuel, you know? oh, wow. And so we had to kind of back off and he, you know, I'm sure you should have him on the show. He, he would probably say that, you know, that he's very different and he's nothing like that, but you know, he, there are a lot of interesting, what, one of the many reasons I did this show was because, first of all, people, as you guys know, are fascinated by the backstage life of performers. Sure. Um, and this was a chance to do it right. Mark Wahlberg, it was loosely based on his life, um, very loosely. Um, but there are very specific characters that we could use as a jumping off place. and. And Ari is this fascinating guy that lives in all these dualities where you think he's a pig, but he's monogamous. Mm -hmm. um, he appears to be uh, racist, but he's an equal opportunity offender. And he really loves these people and is, is giving them tough love. So I just knew from the jump, like, if we get this right, it could be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, so to to get back to the Christmas date, we'll get to Entourage in a bit, but to get back to Christmas date, you know, to to ask you how you were able to play this type, people yeah. haven't really been paying attention in a way too then because you have played all different types of characters throughout. You have played and and the one thing that you notice in this trailer that you notice throughout everything is that you have a uh sarcastic humor about you that the way you deliver things it's always consistent. Like that's the one kind of spine that I see all the time. You always have that. The way that you have the ability to deadpan and make people laugh like you've been doing to us already. Um, you know, that's still there. You see that in the trailer. You weren't Ari in all of these other shows and, and almost not even close to that. But, you know, like, you know, Larry Sanders wasn't Ari. We, we weren't that type of guy. So I think people who, you know, all of a sudden just kind of think that that's the only thing you did. They haven't been paying attention. Yeah. But, you know, when I was younger, uh, I would get offended. Uh, but as you get older, you realize that, first of all, there's no time to get offended. Don't take anything personally yeah. um, ever. But just because I've been working as an actor my entire life doesn't mean that anyone has to have a reference for me. And, you know, I played the gay Versace salesman in Rush Hour, mm -hmm. uh, which was a complete and utter departure from everything I've ever done. And, um, you know, my background, no, no one in this country really talks about, no one's ever asked me, hey, where'd you go to school? Whereas, you know, if you're over there in the UK, they wear it as a badge of honor and they go through the rites of passage. They go to drama school and, you know, and, and as did I went to NYU and the national theater, of great Britain and all these places. And um, so my, I have a very diverse background. 
Uh, I think you you interviewed Tim Robbins. Is that yeah. correct? Yep, two mm-hmm. weeks ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Tim, Tim is amazing, and Tim was my a little bit overrated. <laughs> <laughs> she Lori's, overrated. She's good deadpan I'm just too. Kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, um, he actually he's underrated <laughs> um, for many reasons. Um, he's a brilliant guy and and a, a great he's artist, the sweetest guy, and an incredible teacher. And he was my teacher, and he taught me a form called Commedia dell'arte which is what I was playing the entire time in Entourage, which is completely emotionally invested over the top, but rooted in sincerity. Yeah. And, and you, you, and you got to do, uh, you, you did Tim, uh, Tim, right. You did um, Bob Roberts with him and you did the player with him. Yeah. And you know, Bob Roberts, I was, I was, I was an extra. And it's funny for whatever reason, when I was watching your, your stuff with Tim, I, I was reminded that I was, at the time on stage in Chicago and Tim being so generous, wanted to include all of us. <laughs> and um, there was just no time. So I ended up just kind of being an extra in that, but that was, that was my journey. I did 40 movies before Entourage yeah. and, you know, became, you know, was an overnight success and <laughs> won the fresh face of the year award at 37. <laughs> and when I accepted my award, I said, there's nothing fresh about my face. <laughs> 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 Um, but Tim, Tim, you know, I really owe it so much to Tim because he taught me this form that set me free. Um, because if you can play these heightened emotions and play them sincerely, then that's really fun. Then, you know, any, anything's possible. Um, and, you know, they say chewing, you're chewing up the scenery. It's too much. But if it's real, then, you know, you can get away with a lot. Sure. And, you know, Tim was... Um you know, he's one of the warmest people that we spoke to. And, you know, you could tell just how passionate he is just talking about, you know, his craft. You know, he had has this podcast, Bobo Supreme, which is, uh, you know, a, a Trump type of uh, audio experience that he released. So he literally, because of COVID, couldn't film it. So he turned it into what's like an old school radio show. Um, with, you know, full acting and sound effects and it's fantastic. And to talk to him about it, just to see the passion in in him, you know, for someone who has literally nothing to prove to anyone at this point, um, he was just, you know, fantastically passionate about it. So I could see how just him telling you pretty much anything, how you'd want to lean in and listen, you know? Yeah, he's he's such a brilliant guy and opinionated and, and as a teacher, you, he, you'd get up there and let's say you were, you know, it was, a, it was a ton of improv before we would dig into the text. And he would, if you made an entrance, you have to make an entrance with the emotionality at 10. And as if you just won the lottery or you just heard the worst news of your life or whatever. And <laughs> if you weren't rooted in sincerity and if the, if, if the audience didn't believe your, didn't believe you on stage, he would ask you to leave the stage. Wow. He would say, your, your agent's on the phone. You got to leave the stage. You got to pick up a call. Mm-hmm. And you would have to leave. The, so the uh. only way to stay on stage would be totally rooted fully in sincerity. Wow. So and- like, I, and I'm, you know, I grew up playing sports and, and stuff, and I have a very competitive spirit. And just the, the brilliant competitiveness of that, where he's really asking you to step up and immerse yourself in it and and commit fully. Um, whenever I would talk like this before, back in the entourage days, I would just get hammered for being pretentious. Oh, you know, please. like, oh my God, stop talking about acting. But now we're living in times, as you guys know more than anyone, where we have these long form conversations right. so that we can actually figure out who people are. So I'm thankful for this form. Absolutely. That's this is the whole point of this podcast is, you know, there there's a lot more to people than what you see. Um, you know, you you also mentioned, you know, the theater and, and, and going to school. But you also your mom and dad were actors and they have the Piven Theater in, in Chicago um, that that they started where they're they're teaching acting to pretty much anyone who wants to learn it, which so you 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 almost were lucky enough to have two schools either that or it's the complete opposite it was bad for you but but you know you you actually got two different perspectives i'm sure on, on the craft i got many different perspectives on it um and yeah my parents were, were my acting teachers from the time i was a kid 
And I still see my mom all the time. We're going to see her today. And it's still it's still great. You know, as people get older, one of the th- reasons why they decline is they don't have that connection to 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 the things that they love um, and staying vital. And so, like, during the, during this time, I would work on monologues with her and stuff. And it's just fun and great. And uh, so and, and then for the past couple of years, I've been doing stand up comedy and I've never done that. Yep. Um, and, you know, if that's, uh, you know, once again, you know, I love it because people count you out from the jump. Mm-hmm. They go, look, there's no way, there's no way you can do this. And I love that because I love performing and suddenly, you know, you've been, a bad analogy is I've been singing other people's songs <laughs> for <laughs> many decades and now I'm b- being asked to be a singer songwriter. Mm-hmm. And, um, but what people don't know is that I've been improvising since I was a child and my first job out of college was at Second City. Yeah. With a guy named Chris Farley that again shows you how old I am. And so <laughs> you just go, you go on tour and you go around and you're improvising entire shows, which means you're writing on your feet with a group and a context, but you're not doing it alone on the mic. And so I was, all, you know, it's, all roads kind of have led to stand up and it's terrifying, but I've been loving it. Yeah. And you're like I said earlier, you know, the, the, the kind of spine of who you are has always been funny, you know, even in you, you can, you, every role that I can think of at some point or another, for the most of them, you made us laugh and, and that's it. That's delivery. That's, you know, the being able to, to know how to, it's all timing. So, you know, if, if you write funny jokes, again, you just because you're writing it doesn't mean your ability to deliver it is any different. You do get instant feedback. So I, I'm wondering how that is compared to uh, if you actually love that or, you, or, or it's worse. But <laughs> Well, you know, in the beginning, it's terrifying because, you know, bombing as an adult is not fun, <laughs> right. you know? Uh, bombing at any point is not fun, right. but um, yeah, to, to get up there, you got to put your ego aside. And I've done that my whole life. I've always been the underdog, always. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was the the ultimate kind of underdog journey in the way that doesn't matter what you've done in your past, can you make them laugh in that moment? And when you're not making them laugh, can you stay in it? not run off stage, dig yourself out. And those moments make you stronger uh, and funnier and you progress by doing them. But just like in acting, if you're worried about looking good or, you know, you're self-conscious or any of that stuff. No good. It's not going to work, man. Yeah. You just got to, you got to commit, um, be totally present, thinking on your feet it's like you're doing all of these things at the same time. You're bringing your entire skill set and you're writing. Um, and then if it's not working, you're writing on your feet. Mm-hmm. And so I knew the only way to get better is to immerse myself in it and doing about 250 shows a year, five to eight shows a week. Wow, that's and a lot. I didn't realize you are doing that. That's right? how you get better. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to, you, you know, could take forever. Yeah, we... Sorry go, about that. Go ahead, Frank. I was just going to ask, is is this one of those things that you found, like, it, it was almost like a new beginning, because I know, like, obviously, you've been acting your whole life, right? So you've been very comfortable, even as you've been growing and learning. And is this, like, is this the closest, I guess, to, like, a new experience you've had in a long, long time? Does that make sense? I'm all about new experiences. Um, and, and probably we're all either doing them or should be embracing them during this time. Um so yeah, I you know you mentioned I look I look younger than I than I am. I think that's one of the variables to be honest with you because when you when you're learning and you're in that childlike state um this will sound I don't know I don't, this will sound pretentious or whatever, but I think your cells on a cellular level you're just very childlike. Mm-hmm. And you you yeah. you you feel and you you have to be in that that state that is that is an open childlike state so it may then manifest to the way you look i guess i don't know yeah, it's almost like nurturing yourself sense. again i guess right it's like yeah like that's what i got out of that like that's how it feels it's it's got to be it's like starting over like just just like growing something new it's really cool 
instead of doing like a vampire facial, <laughs> I'm learning a new task. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's hope that doesn't come up for you anytime soon <laughs> we do uh we do uh, we used to do our show from the comedy cellar in manhattan um that's where we used to do that's it amazing the holy grail of comedy uh, yeah so you know it, it was great to do the show from there because we would always see the comics outside and you know you never know who's going to be there they're all it people just show up all the time there was one night specifically that um you know the the manager came up and she said you know you should come downstairs afterwards and hang out we might have a special guest and it was one night i really couldn't go and of course i go there and chris rock is there and kevin hart is there and dave Chappelle is there and jerry seinfeld is there and they're all just standing on stage talking you know um but you know when i talk to all of these comics and you you see these guys who have done it their whole lives um they're all still when they go to the cellar, they do it to work on what they're doing. They're yeah. always trying to get better. Just like when you're acting, you're always trying to get better. And on the show, I'm always trying to get better. It never changes. You're just always, what's next? How do I go get better? How do I get better? So it, it, it is really cool. Frank, that was a good point. It's, it's, you, you could have easily just stayed in acting and been completely happy. But to go out of your comfort zone is awesome. Yeah, and, and all those guys that you named you know, are the goats. Mm -hmm. And they are all still working on their material and they're still brilliant and humble at the same time. And that's a, just a really rare combination. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, I love, I, 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 I love the form. I'm humbled by it. And um, yeah, I remember getting up at, at the cellar for the first time and, and because I've been on stage for decades, I, it's my home. But getting up there, I remember at the cellar was, it was really terrifying, yeah. you know, because of all the brilliant people that have inhabited that space. Um, and, I, and, and because I had just been, you know, grinding and, and, and getting, you know, getting my reps in, I was able to survive, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, the, you know, the audience doesn't lie. And, you know, the best comics in the world are in New York. And those audiences have seen a lot. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so it was. It was great. It was. It was incredible. Did you ever try an amateur night when you went to NYU? Amateur night. Like at a comedy club. No, I, I never. No, never did that. I feel like you would have like just tried it just for fun. Yeah, even when you were younger. Since you, you know went what? to Second City afterwards. I just. It was. It making it as an actor and to, to a fault with me was all consuming. Right. Um, and so I didn't even think about splitting my focus then. I wish I would have, mm -hmm. you know, but I didn't. Um, and I was always, uh, you know, studying, putting on shows or whatever. And then from the moment I left college, I've always been working as an actor and growing up in a family of actors, you know, you, it's just such an honor to be able to work. So you're always, for good or ill, working and then chasing more work. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. But, um, you know, you want to talk about being in front of an audience. And I do actually want to get to what it's like to perform in front of cars in a second. But while I have <laughs> this thought, <laughs> um, I actually saw you on Broadway in, um, in a play called Fat Pig um quite a quite a while ago and and you were great you know it's it was one of the reasons why i went was because you were in it and i wanted to check it out um but it was a good play and like you were really really good in it um and i was just curious like how how often were you doing stage before i was even aware that you were doing it uh from the time i was eight years old I, i've been on stage um with no with no rust because I was just very lucky. My parents had a, had a had theater. A theater. <laughs> right. and, um, so I, so I grew up in it. Um, and yeah, there was, there has not been any downtime. The only downtime I had was playing high school football and, you know, being a five foot nine Jewish linebacker. <laughs> uh, why is that funny? There are a dime a dozen. Come on. Yeah. There are, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of them. 
<laughs> out there. What's that joke from uh, Airplane when she says, why don't you read this leaflet, famous Jewish sports legends, when she was <laughs> looking for something to read? <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, so I, I got to get back to the to the cars, because I know you just did a show last week, literally a drive in show. So how was that? What was that experience like? Was it bizarre? It was it was very bizarre. But again, <laughs> um, having logged the hours, uh, I'd never navigate anything like that. And, and I've been in so many different situations. So you got to prepare pair like okay um i i hadn't slept last night you guys because i had a nightmare that i was being heckled by a kia sorrento <laughs> you, know what's happening. you know um i was in orange county and trump was just there so i said that hey. makes sense he's orange this is his county. <laughs> and these are kind of hacky jokes but i was like i gotta i gotta connect with them and the and and you know I'm up on a basically being projected on a bouncy castle, which is a school. <laughs> it's not really and, and it looked like I was in a cave in Kabul. Like, <laughs> strange lighting from below. Um, they were honking. I don't know if I was bombing or if I was doing well. I didn't know what was happening. But listen, here's the reality. The reality is I stuck it out and I, I, I you know, you, you just put everything into it. And I don't know if I got anything back. It was basically like my entire childhood. It was um, <laughs> it was a it was a completely surreal experience, but those make you better, you know, because then when you go into a proper situation like the great comedy seller, which is the prototype for comedy, low ceiling, you know, you you feel like you're all in it together. It's intimate. You you appreciate those moments because you've already, you know, bombed in the middle of a traffic jam. <laughs> So wait, so that was that's how they that's how they did it. They they didn't you couldn't hear them laugh. So if they liked the joke, they would just honk the horn. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> oh, God. Was that right for you? Oh wow, Dude, that's so Obama, weird. Obama just was speaking at the same kind of thing, and he was like, "I'm getting a lot of honks." Like it was so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Obama's never bombed. No, that's true. Good point. Uh, Good point. Ever. Um, I mean, I, I remember I was lucky enough to stump for him in Chicago, being from Chicago. And um, I was there with my mother and it was an incredible time. And I got up on stage and uh, I don't remember. I think someone couldn't show up. So I would just fill in for them on stage. And and I introduced him in, in Chicago at a train station. And I was backstage with him and Michelle just before he was elected. Oh, wow. And my, my mom grabbed a hold of Michelle's amazing arms and said, <laughs> don't forget about the arts. Oh, and wow. Which, uh, it was, That's it great. Was a funny moment. Yeah, they were they were what the Jews call the, a mensch. They were menches. They were very <laughs> sweet. Very yeah. sweet. Yeah, that that's a great story, man. Because you you know you got to spend some time with him. You know, just yeah. And he even listen, a He told me that that Entourage was his favorite show, mm. and I, I just thought, no, there's no way, there's no way. <laughs> and immediately I thought, you say this to everyone. You know, no, but he loves Rahm Emanuel. Was his um, chief of staff, so Absolutely. it makes sense. Could be, yeah. It it, it it later it made sense. In the moment, I didn't buy it even though he's such a genuine guy who I don't know if he meditates, but he must because he never takes the bait. He's always very calm. Mm -hmm. um, and I just imagine him going up to Ray Romano saying, man, you know, Yours is my favorite show. And we're like, oh, thank you, man. I can't be honest. It means a lot to me. You know? um, but I talked to Reggie Love, who was his head of security, and he said, yeah, Barack, he, it. he watches it every week. Oh, it's that's, it's that's his favorite show. And I was like, what? Yeah. And then he's actually admitted it. He's, it's, you guys to do a little research. It's on his list, if you can believe it. So that, that was... That was incredible. That is so cool. Yeah. That's a humble brag, brother. That was good. Nice humble brag. Put it right in there. In there. <laughs> well done. You're going to teach me something by the time this is over. <laughs> but you, uh, you know, to, to get back to Entourage now, because it is also one of my favorite. You're, you're actually in two of my favorite shows of all time. Larry Sanders show and, and an Entourage, you know, um, in Entourage, you, I mean, 
the, I think the reason why people so much gravitate to to Ari and the way you played Ari is because you you were you didn't show up on screen. You exploded on the screen. Like every time the character Ari Gold was there, shit happened no matter what, you know? And it's weird because the fascination was supposed to be in the beginning about the celebrities and what it's like to live like a celebrity. But as time went on, it was more about the back and forth stuff that Ari was doing in the way, you know, it was, we got to learn a little bit about every one of these characters. So, you know, I know there are some questions here that you've gotten a million times. I'm sure you've spoken about this show so much that you you're almost exhausted to it but um at what point like when this show, show starts you start working on it you don't know it's going to blow up of course like when did you start feeling oh wow i think we might have something special here you have to understand when we aired it was just before social media mm-hmm. so we had no clue i started getting a sense when people would tell me that they watch in groups and they, it was like, you know, on Sunday nights, they would all get together. And I started seeing, you know, a response. I was on, as I said, I'd done a bunch of movies and, and, and been on TV shows that were hits. You know, I was on Ellen when she came out of the closet. That's that's a, a turning point moment, a big yeah, moment. Very true. But the way that people were responding was different. And there was more and, and you know so i started sense so it was to be honest with you i i didn't i didn't really it, it took about three years before we got a sense that it was popular mm-hmm. and you know there is you've got um four emmy nominations three wins in a row for that golden globe you won for that show as well um and were nominated almost every single year and rightfully so um does do you start to you know in talking about the craft and and how your your mindset changes does the pressure then get a little higher once you start getting nominated and you start winning do you start thinking like people are watching you now because of that and people are looking for that or is it just you just do your thing and and let the chips fall where they may it's all inspiring i was never the popular vote um i was a journeyman actor then i still am uh that mentality never changes. The fact that I'm, I might have more people watching, you know, growing up in Chicago and playing 99 seat houses, mm-hmm. trying to get an audience, handing out flyers, a bigger audience is inspiring. That's what you're working towards. So um, I never, uh, it, it wasn't ever something that made me uh, anxious or fearful. It just was inspiring. Okay, we got an audience. Yeah. Because there's a responsibility, you know, not to sound even more pretentious, but you just respect the space that you occupy when you perform so that always. And during the movie, Russell Wilson, you know, the quarterback for the Seahawks, was in, it was, it was in the show, you know, had a cameo and he was great. Hmm. And he was watching one of my scenes and he said to me, let me ask you, when you're performing um, each take, is it like the regular season, playoffs, or the Super Bowl? Yeah. And I said, the Super Bowl. And he goes, me too, man. And yeah. I would never equate myself with the great Russell Wilson, but I guess we have a similar mindset in the way that if you're lucky enough to be there, you're going to have – you go hard on every play. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to, to, to a fault. I mean, you know, I didn't realize, like, it, you know, it takes its toll. I mean, I'm having – you know, an emotional crisis every take, you know, yeah. because the character is so emotionally invested, mm-hmm. you know, and you do multiple, multiple takes. I remember trying to run. I was going to train after one of our shoots and I started running and my hands started tingling. And I was like, I started falling over. My body was like, I thought I'm not tired, but uh, your body thinks that you're like going through this. You know, I never, I don't phone it in. So I don't, you know, I'm not faking it. So yeah. it was, it, you know, it was it was an incredible time, and it was all it was all written by Doug Ellen, you know. I don't know if he gets enough credit for that, but yeah. that was that was his that was his baby. He he envisioned it all, and I was doing it word for word. And people thought, oh, okay, you know, you you improvise, you know, the show, and that's yeah. what 
that's what actors do. It's our job to make it all feel improvisational. Yeah, and what, yeah, but, but I we, think that you don't get enough credit for the your the character acting that you're doing during it, the facial expressions and the gestures and how you're holding your body and slamming a phone and yeah. I think that's where you really like made it your own that no one else could have played that character. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I think a lot of people could have played it, um, but it's just a matter of, uh, like I said before, you know, you've you've got. It's an embarrassment of riches. This it's it's all written. It was all written. It was all there for me. And you just got to throw yourself in. And um, you know, acting is a momentum sport. So you're just you're you're just creating that momentum, and you're you're in it. You're fully in it. And um, it was just a blast. It was. I saw an interview where you said that you kind of felt like you have road rage every time you become Ari before the scene. You get that <laughs> level of anger in you. Well, yeah, you got to, I mean, to tap into, the irony is you're tapping into any, all of us on our lowest vibration are reactive. You know, we're operating out of fear. And, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, um, if you haven't meditated or had your coffee or whatever, or you just get someone slams into the back of your car, you suddenly, you're going to, you know, you're, you're uh, triggered. Yeah. And Ari was constantly triggered. <laughs> and people want me to be Ari, but they do, but you really don't. Right. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want to be around those types of people. Yeah. You know, but when, you know, when I get up on stage and I'm touring, you know, they, they're screaming stuff out and they want me to, they really want me to, you know, call their wife a rusty cunt bucket. And I, <laughs> I can't do wow. it, you know? We're, we're in the middle of a mall. We're right next to a cinema. <laughs> you. You know? Come on, guys. By the way, can I swear on this show? Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, one of my, you know, it's, it's just the sentence, but I always, I still to this day, every time he comes on TV... I scream, and I have no problem with him. It's just because of Ari's line. I scream, fuck you, Bobby Flay. I, like, at the top of my lungs because I just, I see him and it just triggers that scene for me every every single time. <laughs> it's so it's so great to see him thriving on that show. That he, I'm sure you've seen his show, Beat Bobby Flay. Yeah, it's a great oh yeah. Show. Yeah, I, I we watch it all the time. It's it's uh it's addicting, you know, to to sit there and watch it. But uh, every you know every, every time he comes on, I have to get that out of my system first. I, I'm not okay. Well, you know, it's interesting <laughs> and bless him. But you know, he's a brilliant chef, and that's what he does. And now he's and now he's been in front of the camera for so long. He's you know he's very savvy in front of the camera and charismatic, and the show is great. But when he did our show, you know, he and I had to go toe to toe. And his background is not as a performer. Right. And I only know one gear, you know, it's full throttle. So I'm just, I'm just, they yell action. We're having a great time. They yell action. And I'm laying into him, you know? And he, he had the look of terror on his face. Because I, you know, I, I don't pull my punches. I was coming after him. Yeah. And, it, you know, he, he was... He, he was, was genuinely frightened. Right. In your mind, he's having sex with your wife. You know, so it's going to bother exactly. you. Yeah. Those are the givens. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I do want to go over, you know, I, I know we don't have tons of time, but, you know, I, I appreciate you hanging with us as long as you can, because I do want to kind of touch on some of the other. I mean, just there's so many things that you're in that are fantastic. But I think the first time I ever got to, uh, to know who you are just or in anything at all was say anything with Cameron Crowe, which um, that famous scene in the parking lot, um, you know, where, uh, you know, you're just his friends that are just trying to help him out and advising him. And, you know, let's also, I also connected with it because, you know, here's this wonderful hat that you were wearing in that scene. And I connected with it because this is what I used to wear as a kid. <laughs> so, so, you know, I had some like problems. Same, same, <laughs> same. <laughs> uh, 
Yet another humble brag. You, why do you this, always have to bring it around to you? That's a humble brag. <laughs> that. you, you have a lot of hair, bro. That's a lot of hair. I had the had a had a lot of hair. <laughs> Long time gone. Long time gone. But uh, so that that's like the first time. Like, do you re- do you remember much about uh, you know working with Cameron Crow on that? I remember all of it. Cameron Crow is another genius. He uh, is a guy who was working for Rolling Stone and a kid, you know, is a journalist out there just defying all the odds and and crushing it and, and you know, taught himself how to become this incredibly brilliant and prolific writer director. And uh, he came to town to Chicago to recruit John Cusack. And um, John was already a movie star. And he and John and I met when we were eight years old. Oh, wow. At Seven Theater. And um, Cusack and I were roommates at the time and were like 16 years old. No, no. By then, I, 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 I forgot exactly. 18. I forgot how old we were. But, um, but John was already a movie star and crushing it. And it's funny because, you know, there are these different points in your life back then I was the, the Cusack plus one. I was always his plus one. Right. You know, people were crawling over me to get to John. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it, these are the different points of your life. And so I was lucky enough in that particular case, because, I, because John was my best friend, to audition for Say Anything. And I remember our audition, we were just, we were lunatics. Our audition was like, I mean, we had, we had set fire to a moped and <laughs> the moped was burning behind us literally. And we're just improvising. Cause there's all, all the, the 40 movies I did before entourage. If you were to go back and try to look at my part on in a script, they would be almost non-existent. And my job was to always try to take a, you know, a, a just a tiny little scrap and make a meal out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why you say, you know, it's my signature thing with the humor. That's how you stay in the picture. Mm-hmm. Um, and every single time it was like one scene and they'd come back and go, hey, man, can you stick around? Sure. Two scenes. And it became three scenes. Yep. And, you know, and then camera would come to me for singles and go, hey, man, can you come in during singles and, and, and give us a little comedy? We'll shoot it on our lunch break. Oh, so, cool. you know, that's that's how I have a career, really. You got to you just got to make something out of nothing. I yeah. saw you said once too that you were shooting with Dustin Hoffman and you're like, I stood next to him because they're not going to cut me out if I'm next to Dustin. <laughs> yeah. That's but so like, smart. Well, right there, he's, you know, my, my hero. I, I grew up watching him and he's, he's one of the goats. Mm-hmm. And just to even have a chance to, to kick it around with him was, was incredible. And I, you know, growing up with, Got, got a chance to work with him and De Niro and Morgan Freeman and all these people. And it was just incredible just to share the same space as them and to, and to be able to, to kick it around with them. And you, you just, you look for those moments and you get better. And, you know, it's old cliche that no role is too small, but it's true. It's just true. You know, um, it's your job to get in there and, you know, on the day, possibly, I mean, you have to pick and choose your battles. The director may be going, you know, what are you doing? Um, but if you've really got an angle on something and you can contribute, you got to be brave and go for it. Yeah. When, when you said, uh, when you mentioned the crumbs, the first thing I thought of was gross point blank. Yeah. In my opinion, the funniest line is that that guy's blood. Like, I don't know why it's just the way you delivered it or whatever it was like that made me to laugh the hardest. And, and that's what I said earlier is that in the beginning, it's, oh, that's that guy again. He's funny. That's that guy again. And I think it was about the time of Larry Sanders show that I knew you as Jeremy Piven. And, you know, because um, that was just a, a, a great role that you played as the head writer and just paranoia through the roof and, and everything else that went with it that's really i think when people get to start seeing you every single week on a show that they love it i think it's a lot different than they see a movie and then move on from it so you know with larry sanders you're working with i mean jesus jeffrey tambor you know gary shanley um and uh rip torn i mean my god like it's just it's a clinic there, but I can also imagine it's a little intimidating. Uh, it, it should have been more intimidating, but I was just so 
I, I so desperately wanted to contribute and they were all our geniuses and Gary, God rest his soul. Um, it was my first job out of college. Um, but I was, I was prepared in the way that, you know, I, I've been on stage my whole life. And so, um, once again, there's an example of like me and Wally Langham who plays, you know, the other writer, they couldn't, when we auditioned, they couldn't decide between the two of us. So they literally just said, we're going to cast both of you and we're just going to split the lines up. You take half the lines, you take half the lines. Oh, really? So yeah, it was supposed to be one character. And so, um, you know, each week you thought, you know, I could be fired at any moment, but my job mostly was to try to keep a straight face and not lose it because <laughs> Jeffrey Tambor is one of the funniest human beings on the planet. Yep. Ever. Hey now. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And he's digging into these scenes and he's an example of how you play comedy. You play it a little more serious than the serious stuff. Mm -hmm. He was playing it like a Greek tragedy <laughs> and it right. was so <laughs> was. funny. And so there are times if you look at that show and I'm just kind of, you know, just trying to trying to hold it together. So yeah, I was just basically some, you know, random role player on the bench for the Chicago Bulls while yeah. they were going for their six championships. But I got to be around it and I got to contribute and I got to, you know, to take it all in. And we were on the same lot as Seinfeld. And I didn't even have a TV because I have this mentality of I'm still a broke actor. So I'm living in a pool house while I'm on TV. Oh, wow. <laughs> and um, Mark Hirschfeld, who cast Seinfeld, saw me in the parking lot. And he goes, hey, uh, could you audition for, I've got a great role for you in, in, in Seinfeld. And I'd never seen Seinfeld, but I've, of course, heard about it. You know, they're the Beatles, but I'd never seen it. Mm. And I was like, you know, I can never turn down an audition. Um, but I was like, you know what, man, I'm on this show, the Larry Sanders show. He goes, no, I know but maybe you could come over and just, you know, audition. And then maybe we can, you know, you could film it when you're not. I said, sure. So I auditioned and I had met Jason Alexander in the parking lot. Mm. A lot of parking lots. This is some yeah. parking lot. It's an amazing <laughs> parking lot. CBS Radford. Imagine how many honks you'd get there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I went in and auditioned for Seinfeld. For I don't know if you know that I played George Costanza. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And I got the role and, and Jerry was like, oh, you know, oh my God, you must be such a fan of the show. You know? <laughs> and I had, I was like, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> you know, I'd never seen the show. I'm such a dummy. <laughs> I'm being, it's so sacrilegious that I'm saying all this right now that I was actually on the show without seeing it. Hey, but that I happens. It's a good thing that I hadn't seen it because I wasn't so overwhelmed by them and they were all so kind and generous and cool and every one of them. You know, and they didn't have to be. I was some random dude coming in and they were incredible. And I got to, you know, kick it around with them. And it was so fun. Um, and I've run into Jerry since then. And he's always just such a mensch, really sweet guy. Yeah. Um, it's there's also um, I think it's better maybe in a way that you didn't at any point um, see the show because then you would have played George completely differently that you did. So maybe the way not knowing maybe helped. I mean, you didn't watch anything about it before you went in and auditioned? No, I didn't have a TV, man. Paul Sims, who was the head writer on, on the Larry Sanders show, came to my house. He goes, why are you living in the pool house? <laughs> right. He's like, you're, you're on a television show. <laughs> That's kind of point. He's like, you don't have a TV, man. What, what's wrong with you? I was like, oh, yeah, man, I got to, you know. I just always <laughs> had that mentality of like, I don't know, could all go away tomorrow. I'm in the pool house. It's a, it's a nice pool house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It kind of keeps you dri keeps you driven, I guess. You know, um, yeah. keeps you humble. It's exactly. Uh, you know, you mentioned Jeffrey Tambor, and, and I'm sure you you know this, and you've been told this many a time. But you're technically in Arrested Development without actually being in Arrested Development. Um, they uh, in one of the newer seasons, they took the entourage beginning. And they actually had a club called and Jeremy Piven. <laughs> and they went to the club called and Jeremy Piven in Arrested Development. And I think at one point, Will Arnett, who played Job, 
goes, no, I'm at this cool club called Jeremy Pivon. Like he says it <laughs> wrong like in, in typical Job fashion. So like you're even in that show without being in that show. Well, I would love to actually be in that show. That <laughs> I know. Show is unbelievable. Absolutely. Top I five. I love all those guys. And I would see Jason Bateman, you know, here or there. And Jason always had the air about him like he was on to something in a good way, in yeah. a good way. Like he just always knew even when he, before any of this, he just had that confidence, like that he's going to crush it always. Um, and you know, that watch this transition. Go. Olivia, who plays my daughter mm. in Christmas day for, for my dad, she has that energy. I, you haven't seen the movie, but you saw the trailer, right? Just the trailer, yeah. Right. yeah. And you see her, and she's going toe-to-toe with me. She has no fear. Mm-hmm. She's crushing it. You know, she reminds me of my nieces. She is not even slightly mm. intimidated or impressed by me yeah. <laughs> in, in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, she, she reminds seems like me she... of my niece, Pearl. Um, you guys know Pearl because she Pearl broke the internet. She basically created Funny or Die, do you remember this little sketch with Will Ferrell where this little baby is like, give me my money, bitch. Yeah. Land, it's called the landlord. And Pearl is Will Ferrell's landlord. No way. That's, That's my niece, Pearl. Wow. Look at that. It's so cool. I do remember that sketch. It's only had a hundred million. <laughs> wow. That's, that's insane. She's um, still taking a victory lap. <laughs> As she should. As she should. That's, that I was is- teaching her how to play the drums the other day. And um, because I play the drums all the time, Mm -hmm. and I was just you know having her just sit in the pocket, and she was like, and she was hitting it, and uh, I said, Pearl, you could do this. You you you've got a good you've got a good basic rhythm, and she goes, "Uh, I spent my life playing the violin. (laughs) I was like, Pearl, you're a child. Do anything you want, Uncle Jeremy. I'm having a midlife crisis, man. I want to be a rock star. I want to be a rock drummer. And she goes, I think you're a little too old to have a midlife crisis. <laughs> oh, real nice. Real nice. <laughs> yeah, I, as, hate as, I hate Pearl. As you, as you can see from the guitars behind me, very similar. Like, you know, back then I thought, you know, look, I mean, I'm going to I'm gonna make it. I'm going to have my band and we're going to do it, you know, and all of the stuff that goes along with that. But you know, now it's like when I when I play the guitar, I'm like, maybe I'll work on some songs. I'm like, nobody wants to hear songs from me at this point. Like, I'll do it for my own good, but you know, who wants to hear that? And Franco laughed a little too much at that. We'll, we'll, we'll just, deal I with that. I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't laugh. <laughs> okay, fine. But you got you just gotta. But that's the whole thing. I think we're living in in times where we're really consumed and concerned with how we're testing. Yeah. You know, and it's just it's a creative creativity killer, you know, yep. you know, if you spend your life trying to be the popular vote, man, it's just it's a slippery slope, you know, yeah. and, and uh, you know, I, I feel for for, you know, kids coming up, you know, there's so much competition, there's so much information and, you know, just go play your guitar. I'm going to go play my drums. We'll get in a band together. Yeah, I'll jam with you. Know. Mediocre. The rest of your crew, crew will laugh at us. It'll it's be fine, a whatever. nightmare. I don't care. Mm-hmm. We're going to write up the first song. going to be called Humble Brag. I'm telling you there right you now. Go. I'm going to work on it tonight. <laughs> Let's do but, it. Uh, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I, I, I do need to tell you straight up, like you should never be concerned about coming off pretentious because it's fascinating to hear um, your perspective on things and just how you do these different roles and, and how you get ready for them. So, you know, that's that's your popular vote comment from me right there is you should never do that because this was fascinating to hear that, you know, you talk about it. Um, and for the people who just want Ari, they don't deserve Jeremy, frankly. Well, that's incredibly sweet. If you were only a woman, I would marry you. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time. I can transition. You know? There's also technology for that now. Yeah, we're, well, well, are you we're, we're there. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm considering it. <laughs> um, no, but um, I'm listen. I'm I'm fascinated by this forum. Uh, I'm uh, doing my own podcast that will be released. It's oh, going to be awesome. called "How You Live in J Piven." Okay, oh, I like that. Yeah. Great name. <laughs> <laughs> and um you know it's we're, i'm all ready to go we're just working out the particulars and um so i'm going to be 
joining your world. It's, you know, it's, it's really, it's really great to sit down with you guys for an hour and, and get a sense of everyone. And, and this is really cool. I really like it. And yeah, I guess, I guess I've been, you know, banged up a little bit, you know, and, um, you know, I need to listen to my own advice to, you know, don't worry about the chatter and the noise. Yep. Absolutely. Cause this is great. And I know we're going to get great feedback on this because, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why, like we've done 300 something episodes now we're in, we've done everything from just hang out as a group to, you know, now this has become what this is. And, it's the most fascinating to me because I get to learn, you know, we say the hole is your portal to peek behind things and see who people really are. So, you know, I'm looking forward to the podcast. I'm definitely looking forward to my dad's Christmas date, which is uh, November 6th um, in theaters and uh, on demand as well. Um, I will. I hope there's a day that comes that I can uh, come see you do stand up and not in a car, which would be fantastic. Um, I, I'm thinking about, I'm not making this up, coming to New York and, and doing some car shows. I'm, I know that sounds insane, mm -hmm. but, you know, look for me at a traffic jam near you <laughs> very soon. Yeah, well, I, I put you on the Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just driving and doing drugs. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, anything's possible, man. Yeah, well, I, I put up I put up the website, jeremy-piven.com. We're going to have to find the real the guy who has jeremypiven.com and, and make that right. I'll but, go here <laughs> my um, parents' driveway in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. A lot of good Wawa's out there, let's, too. Let's get into it, man. Sure. I love the good people of Jersey. That would be – I listen, don't pull a knife unless you're going to use it. I will perform <laughs> in, in your parents' driveway. There mm -hmm. we go. That, All right. Why not? Let's set it up. But by yeah. the way, just, just to get back really quickly to this movie um, – mm -hmm. I, I think we, we all, this will come out right after the election. We all yeah. need to laugh. And this thing, it feels like comfort food, but it's not predictable. And it's, you know, we need some, some good, funny content now. So check it out. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to play the trailer again. So stick around and watch. Okay. Um, also, uh, Jeremy, if you don't mind, would you mind doing a quick ID for us before you go? If I had a publicist, they would say no, but I don't have one. So, yes. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, publicists don't let you do that. Huh? It's weird because no. it, it's funny because I asked Tim Robbins to do it, and I never, like, usually don't even keep it in. Um, but sometimes I do because it, it, it's funny. When I asked Tim Robbins, he did it, no problem, and then he leaned in and he goes, I don't usually do that. And I was like, oh, thank you so much, Tim. That's really nice. Like, it's an honor. But um, but thank you again, Jeremy. Again, everybody, check out my dad's Christmas date, uh, November sixth. Uh, no, December sixth. No, November. November sixth. November sixth, oh. right after the it, election, Lori. It's it's right after the election, so you're either going to be curled up in a ball or taking a victory lap. Oh God! Either way, let me make you laugh. Yeah, let's <laughs> hope it's a victory lap. <laughs> Jeremy, thank you again so much. It was an honor. I really appreciate it. Thank um, you, man. I, I appreciate it. that. Was great. Best of luck. Have fun with mom tonight. What's that? Have fun with mom tonight. I will. She's the best. <laughs> Joyce Piven is is glued to the TV right now. She she can't get enough of this election. Yep. It's too much. It's too much. We all are. I agree. Thank you guys. That was amazing. All it was right. a blast, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeremy. Are you Appreciate sure you Jeremy. were recording? Huh? Yeah. You please don't, <laughs> don't terrify freak me out now. About that. You yeah. Have I, to, uh, uh, Jeremy, shit. we, we got to do it again, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, if you don't mind. So we're here with Jeremy Piven. Welcome to the hole. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the worst part. It happened to me once. I had comedian Ralphie May on, and we started doing the show, and I we were all in a room together, and Ralphie was going. It was like five minutes in, and I look, and I notice that uh, Ralphie's mic is not recording, and everybody else's is. And I was like, well, he's he's a pro he's so funny he didn't yeah. care he didn't care he's like all right let's do it again so he yeah. was cool he was cool with it but man i didn't uh, that's bad but yes i just looked now because you made me paranoid so thanks a lot i appreciate it <laughs> thank you guys i'll have to i'll have to follow you guys on social media absolutely i'm going to share it out and everything i'll send um i'll send an email to your team but i'll also tag you if you don't mind in the tweets and everything too let's do it all right, Jeremy, thank, thank you, you again. Everybody thank take you. care, and See thank you, you for everybody. listening to Bye. the whole. Bye. Bye-bye. Later. Man, what and a blast.
Awesome. Yes, well, you. yeah, I want to remind everybody one more time, uh, please go to the whole podcast.com subscribe review. We are getting tons of new subscribers and I'm jazzed. Franco's just as excited. You could see it in his eyes. I want to do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got a long way to go before that, but we're working on it. There's not much else you can do up there, Franco. Yeah, I know. No, that's, there that's, isn't. I could work at a tire warehouse, and that's about it. I know it's true, but, uh, I, but thank you. I think you need out. qualifications for that, though. <laughs> I think I need to be a man. I'm not quite there yet. Oh, you'd be the best man ever. Another couple years. Yeah. So, uh, anything? I guess you know what? Oh, actually, anybody who's listening to this, the day after the election, um, we're gonna do a live ele- post-election special the night after the election at 7 p.m. Eastern time, 4 uh, p.m. Pacific time. Franco's just hearing about this now, but he's gonna get the invitation soon. Noel Kassler is going to be back and joining us for the episode, and I'm inviting some of our. Uh, previous guests to kind of pop in throughout we're going to be live there's not going to be any kind of uh uh, plan because we might as uh, jeremy said either call be curled up in a ball or celebrating we don't know what which one that is just yet so go to the whole podcast.com click the subscribe button click the subscribe button in youtube and you will be notified whenever we have a new episode and when we go live thank you for listening to the whole i am rob sprantz i'm franco del valley i'm laura levine later motherfuckers (laughs) you <laughs>